How long halt ye between two opinions? If Yahweh, the Lord, be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Whose words were these? These are the words of Elijah to an apostate Israel. They had forsaken Yahweh and had worshipped Baal. What did the people at Mount Carmel answer Elijah at that time? The Bible states, and the people answered him, not a word. That's found in 1 Kings 18.21. We ask ourselves the question, why didn't they answer? Were they afraid? Were they confused? Didn't they know who they were worshipping? Didn't they know the difference between Baal, Satan, and the Lord, Yahweh, the Creator? Our study or presentation today is about the sins of Jeroboam. We want to find out what the sins of Jeroboam were and if Christianity is repeating those sins today. If they do, it is probably mostly due to ignorance. But ignorance is no excuse for error or sin if there is every opportunity to know the will of God. He has given us his word that we may become acquainted with his teachings and know for ourselves what he requires of us. Before I continue, I want to say that this presentation is not intended to be an accusatory pointing device or to condemn anyone, but to encourage individuals to study for themselves and to find out if these things are so, just like the Bereans did in Acts 17.11. Some things are hard to understand because of the way one has been raised, because of one uh, has been taught, and things one has been accustomed to. However, truth is truth, and we must be willing to learn and always have an open mind. The Bible says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Is that a good idea? Hide Bible truth within your heart. God's word is really true. It is his lamp to guide your feet. It is his voice to you. Talking about the students in our schools, Ellen G. White stated, The Bible and the Bible alone should be their counselor. The word of God is as the leaves of the tree of life. Here is met every one of those who love its teachings and bring them into the practical life. Many of the students who come to our schools are unconverted, though they may have been baptized. They do not know what it means to be sanctified through a belief of the truth. They should be taught to search and understand the Bible, to receive its truth into the heart and carry them out in the daily life. So Christians should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the earth as an overwhelming surprise, and this preparation they should make by diligently studying the Word of God and striving to conform their lives to its precepts. The words of the Bible and the Bible alone should be heard from the pulpit, and that's taken from Prophets and Kings, page 624 to 626. First, let's talk about Christianity as a whole. Christianity is actually a hybrid religion, a mixture of many of the teachings of Yeshua HaMashiach in Greek Jesus Christ, but not the same religion he taught. Today's professed followers of the Messiah do in no way reflect the first century church. Christianity in reality is a mixture of Torah, with customs from Babylonian paganism. It is a way of life about the Messiah of Israel, divided into over 30,000 sects or churches over interpreting the Torah, with special days of the year adapted from satanic pagan origins. Adapted from where? Adapted from satanic pagan origins. But all of Yahweh's commanded feasts, as an example listed in Leviticus chapter 23 and in Deuteronomy chapter 16, are neglected. 
Christianity is a system of beliefs based on the Messiah, but acting in accordance through tradition, their customs stem from pagan symbols and observances. When you study history, you will find that Christianity is a monstrosity, a hybrid blending of a diverse number of pagan religions, and the knowledge of this is kept from the people. Believing and doing are often separated in its philosophy. Obedience is praised if it fits traditional forms, but concern, condemned if it fits scriptural instructions. The scripture is being divided and the division exists between the Hebrew and the Gentile Christian in terms of what is to be obeyed or ignored in the Torah. Based on this difference, so in their teaching there is not one body of believers, although this will be denied by most of them. However, Scripture does acknowledge as a way the living word of Yahweh, the Lord, his Torah. That should be our way and is certainly what Yeshua, Jesus, taught while on earth. He did not teach Christianity as we know it today. And this may come as a shock to many people, but that's the way. As Jeremiah 16, 19 states, Surely our fathers have inherited lies. Vanity and things wherein there is no profit. Many things that is being practiced and taught in Christianity today was unknown to the followers of the way at the time of Pentecost, 2,000 years ago. Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, never taught us anything about Sunday, about Easter, about Christmas, about St. Valentine. St. Patrick's Day, popes, nuns, holy water, sacraments, or any separation of his church into a priesthood and laity. Yeshua, the Messiah, is our leader. He is our high priest. We are all priests on level ground with one another. And he is our high priest. What does Yeshua Say in Matthew 23, 8-10. Be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. And all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. If you are studying something and embrace it as a way of living, shouldn't you search it out completely and find where its roots lead? Or why am I doing what am I doing? Shouldn't I know that? If the root is good, the fruit is good. Christianity is a religion without Hebrew roots, mainly Greek or Latin. We can call Christianity a usurper. You remember Esau and his Edomite descendants? They were usurpers. They sought to steal the birthright and promises that were only given to Israel, the overcomers. This is what is at the heart of replacement theology. Today's Christianity, therefore, is like Esau and the Edomites. They modify the covenant and claim the promises made to Israel, the overcomers. How many gates are there in, Ju in New Jerusalem? According to Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. Twelve gates. And you remember what names are written thereon? There are the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. Very interesting. Why wasn't there at least one gate called Christians? Or like Catholics, Protestants, Seventh-day Adventists, Mormons, Baptists? Is that something to think about and to be concerned? We must become spiritual Israelites in order to be allowed to go through one of these gates. Who only will enter through those gates? 
Only those who receive the seal of the living God will have the passport to the gates of the holy city. Only those that are sealed. So we need to know what that seal is with which we are to be sealed with. But that's another message and I may refer it to that a little later on in this presentation. If we love the Creator, if we love His name and His covenant, the Torah, meaning the Ten Commandments, with the statutes and judgments, we will follow the way or the walk of the Messiah, Yeshua, staying faithful to the covenant without alteration. There will be no adding, there will be no subtracting. Listen to what the Bible states in Deuteronomy. When the Lord Yahweh thy God shall cut off the nations before thee, whither thou goest, take heed to thyself, that thou be not snared by following them, after that they be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. So what should they not do? And what should we not do? To follow the customs as they worship. Then it says, Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God. We must study to find out the best way in which to take up the review of our experiences from the beginning of our work when we separated from the churches and went forward step by step in the light that God gave us. We then took the position that the Bible and the Bible alone was to be our guide, and we are never to depart from this position. We were given wonderful manifestation of the power of God. Miracles were wrought. Again and again, when we were brought into straight places, the power of God was displaced in our behalf. This is from a letter, 105, written in 1903. In Ephesians 5.11 we read, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Are these clear, easy to understand instructions? Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them? What about King Jeroboam? At first glance, the story of Jeroboam seems to bear, bear little if any significance, to Christianity today. King Jeroboam became an idolatrous king of ancient Israel who developed a system of worship that involved two golden calves. Because Christians today don't worship golden calves, it is easy to brush off Jeroboam's story while clucking our tongues and sanctimoniously shaking our heads at his primitive folly we then relegate the story to our mental backfile, classifying it as nothing more than of biblical trivia. Certainly this kind of idolatrous foolishness doesn't go on among Christians today. Quite the contrary. A deeper look into the details of this Bible story will reveal that it is extremely relevant to the followers of Yeshua today. We cannot accept anything or everything that we see or hear today. We must test everything if it is truly so, especially when we talk about our beliefs, because our salvation could depend on it. Actually, Jeroboam's sin has become so widespread among Christianity that it has now become standard practice in nearly every church around the world. It is important then that we take a moment to search out the deeper insights of this biblical story, lest our worship be abominable in Yahweh's eyes, as was Jeroboam's. Many nice people think that they worship the Creator and do His will, when in reality they follow pagan practices and honor the arch enemy Satan. And the Seventh-day Adventists, we have a very interesting quote. 
in Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1014, paragraph 3, which goes like that. And if men and women who have the knowledge of the truth are so far separated from the great leader that they will take the great leader of apostasy and call him Christ our righteousness, it is because they have not sunk the chaft deep into the minds of truth. They are not able to distinguish the precious ore from the base material. Is that a sobering thought? Maybe we'll remember Matthew seven twenty one to 23 when Yeshua will be saying to many people that expected to be welcomed into his kingdom, depart from me. They had made a profession to follow him, but actually followed another master. They followed another Jesus. What must each individual do? We must personally with prayers, search deep into the minds of truth. That means that every individual is responsible for himself, for herself, in order to find out what truth and what error is. Yeshua said in John 5.39, Search the scriptures. That applies to all men, not only for the leaders, Everyone must search if he or she wants to find out what truth is. One cannot depend on any individual, whatever his position may be. Or oh, First Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things, as we had in the beginning. Again, it is a duty of every individual to prove all things because it affects his own soul. We must mention that again and again, so we will never forget that. So let's go back to our study. Do Christians unknowingly repeat Jeroboam's sins? Let's think about that. Jeroboam's idolatry actually began hundreds of years before with the construction of the golden calf at the base of Mount Sinai, and here is what happened there. As the picture shows, the Egyptian calf god was usually made of gold and was not a depiction of a single god. The solar disk representing the serpent sun god as the father of the calf god is shown on the head of the golden calf. Most Bible historians believe that the golden calf constructed by Aaron was like the one shown in this picture. Thus, in the idolatrous golden image, two gods were represented, the father, the sun disk, and the son, the calf. But there weren't only two false gods represented before Israel that day. There was a pagan trinity represented in that altar. The third deity Aaron helped the Israelites represent was female. It was not part of the golden calf itself, but rather was part of the altar base. While Moses rightly destroyed the golden calf, he ground it up and gave it to the people to drink as a punishment for the idolatry, its large stone altar base is still standing at the base of Mount Sinai, allowing us to verify the presence of this third god. And as the picture shows, a fence is now constructed, removing access to the stone altar site which once held the golden calf. But upon these stones are telling petroglyphs depicting the Egyptian bull god Apis and his cow wife Hather. It is because the full pagan trinity was represented that Aaron referred to the golden calf not in a singular sense but in a plural. How can I say that? And he received the jewelry at the hand and fashioned it with a graven tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Exodus 32.4 
It does not say this be your God, singular, but it states these be thy gods, plural. He is talking about more than just one God. In the Egyptian false religion, this bovine family represented the unholy trinity. They did not always appear in four-legged form. This was merely believed to be the form they took when they walked the earth. These deities were also known as the sun god Nimrod, with the moon goddess Semiramis being his wife. Their son was a false savior or antichrist, Tammuz. In modern times, the sun god has supposedly manifested as a bull in his earthly travels. This teaching is a basis for the myth of Europa and the bull. Europa, another name for Semiramis, now called Mary, was a virgin. The sun god noted her purity and beauty from above, and the story says that he changed into a white bull, came to earth, enchanted Europa, carried her away, and raped her, and he then returned to the sky. This rape resulted in the birth of the sun god's son, sometimes represented as a calf. Horrifying and depraved as this story is, it is the basis for the name of the continent of Europe. It is also the pagan basis for the current Christian teaching on the Trinity. Totally steeped in pure paganism, this ancient teaching wasn't just isolated to places like Egypt and Europe. Throughout the false religions and pagan mythology of the world, the same trinity can be found. They have different names, but the way they are worshipped and the holy days which honor them are always the same. These days include Christmas, December 25, which was the birthday of Tammuz, Easter, his resurrection, Lent, and the rest of the Christian calendar. Not only was Israel honoring the pagan trinity in the festival to the golden calf, they actually believed that they were worshipping Yahweh in so doing. The Bible states in Exodus 32, 4 and 5, And Aaron received the golden jewelry at their hand and fashioned it, the golden calf, with a graving tool, after he had made it a golden calf, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is the feast of the Lord, the feast of Ye uh, Jehovah. Who gave them the idea to make a golden calf anyhow? It came from Egypt and the surrounding nations. Thus saith the Lord, Yahweh, learn not the way of the heathen, for the custom of the people are vain. We read that in Jeremiah 10, 2-3. Even though they had detailed instructions from the Creator Himself not to do this, they still followed the customs of the pagans. We are talking about the no-gods which they followed. One must ask the question, why did they do it anyhow? Why did they continue to follow the customs of the pagans, which the Creator cannot bless, but brings only curses upon them? In Isaiah 55, 2 and 3, the Creator asks his people the question, Wherefore do you spend money for that which is no bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ears, and come unto me here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. What an invitation from the Creator of the universe. In Ezekiel 33.11, Yahweh asks a question, Why will you die, O house of Israel? Then he says in this verse, saying, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. 
In Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, Yeshua is standing at the door asking for entrance by saying, If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. Revelation 3, the verses 14 to 21 is talking about the church of Laodicea. It also shows very clearly that the presence of Yahweh, the presence of God, is not in the midst of that church. The church is in the Laodicean ch state. The presence of God is not in the midst. That was written in 1898 and can be found in the book Last Day Events, page 49, paragraph 1. Then in Selected Messages, Book 1, page 357, it says, The true witness says of a cold, lifeless, Christless church, the Lord is standing outside, knocking at the door of individual hearts, waiting for somebody to open the door so he can come in. During the past 6,000 years, the invitation is being given to his people to separate themselves from the world, the idols, the traditions of men, and to follow his instructions, his laws, his statutes, and his judgments. Let us now examine the story of Jeroboam's idolatrous sin. About 500 years after the Sinai Golden Calf festivals, Israel split. It was divided into two kingdoms. And why was it divided? The Bible states in 1 Kings 11, 9 and 11, And the Lord Yahweh was angry with Solomon. Why was the Lord angry with Solomon? The wisest and most blessed person on earth. It states in 1 Kings 11, 9, Because his heart was turned from the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. And what was the penalty? We read in 1 Kings 11.11 11, For as much as this is done, he said, And thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rent the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. What was Solomon's great transgression? His great sin against the Creator, Yahweh, that had appeared unto him twice. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 11 about Solomon's polygamy and idolatry. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh or women of Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto thee, these with love. So the Bible states in First Kings chapter 11, and then with verse 4 it starts, For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. That is exactly what happened, didn't it? Exactly the way the Lord had prophesied. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord, his Elohim. It was the heart of David, his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not after, fully after the Lord, as did David, his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and from Moloch, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burned incense and sacrificed unto their gods. Then it states uh, in 1 Kings 11, 9 to 10, And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. And it states further in verse 11, Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, Forasmuch as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, 
which I have commanded thee. I will surely rent the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Therefore, the divided kingdom. About 500 years after the making of the golden calf at Sinai, the kingdom was split. Yahweh had promised Jeroboam ten tribes. Jeroboam ascended to the northern throne, reigning over the ten tribes, while Rehoboam ruled the southern tribes of Judah. The northern king Jeroboam was afraid he would lose his kingdom if the people visited Jerusalem in the south to worship and keep the Feast of Tabernacles according to divine instructions. 1 Kings 12.27 So what was his decision to prevent that to take place? Jeroboam made two fateful decisions. First, he created two golden calves like the Trinity calf Israel set up after leaving Egypt, 1 Kings 12.28. And secondly, he set up new feast days on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the feast that was in Judah. That's in verse 32. The festival was a counterfeit of the Feast of Tabernacles, which begins on the 15th day of the 7th month. Leviticus 23.34. Exactly one month earlier, than Jeroboam's man-made feast. The Bible says, So he made offerings on the altar, which he had made at Bethel on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel, and offered sacrifices on the altar, and burnt incense. 1 Kings 12.33 like Aaron of old, Jeroboam led the people into false trinity worship. This meant that instead of worshiping in Yahweh's ways on Yahweh's days, Jeroboam substituted the pagan system and man-made times of worship in the house of El. Bethel means house of El, or house of God. Archaeological evidences show that Jeroboam's calf was set up for Yahweh worship, just like that of ancient Israel. They actually thought they were worshipping Yahweh, the Creator. The idols were even referred to as the bull calves of Yah, as is explained in Abingdon's Bible commentary. It says there the name Egeliah, bull calf of Yah, on a path heard from Samaria shows how far-reaching was the sin of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. That's on page 119 in that book. According to Genesis 114, the heavenly lights were created to serve for the time when days, years, and religious festivals begin. Genesis 114 from the Good News Bible. These holy appointment times instituted at creation had been set in place by Yahweh himself. Yet now the king dared to set aside Yahweh's appointed times, replacing them with man-made days. And this was nothing short of open rebellion against Yahweh, carried out under the sanctimonious guise of righteous worship, but for selfish reasons. The king's bold defiance of God and thus setting aside divinely appointed institution was not allowed to pass unrebuked. Even while Jeroboam was officiating and burning incense during the dedication of the strange altar he had set up at Bethel, there appeared before him a man of God from the kingdom of Judah, sent to denounce him for presuming to introduce new forms of worship. Prophets and Kings, page 101. So what were the divinely appointed institutions Jeroboam had set aside? It was specifically the Feast of Tabernacles. 1 Kings 12.27 Has this happened in Christianity today? Absolutely. We need to remember that at the very seat of the controversy between our Elohim and Satan, who was once Lucifer, is a particular issue of worship. Yahweh rightfully claims the worship of his created and redeemed beings. Satan has made the blasphemous claim 
that he will be just like the Most High. According to Isaiah 14, 13 to 14, Satan, a created being, covets the worship which rightfully belongs solely to the Creator. So how does he try to accomplish this? He replaced Yahweh's feasts, festivals by festival, with his own or man-made holy days. And the whole world follows thinking they honor the Creator by doing that. There's Christmas, a strictly Roman Catholic word. All of the customs of Christmas predate the birth of Yahshua and are a collection of traditions and practices taken from many cultures and nations. Yahshua was born not on December 25. This date was celebrated because of the birth of Tammuz. Think about it. Can we worship and honor the Creator by involving ourselves with customs and traditions which he himself forbade as idolatry? Can we convince him somehow to Christianize these customs so we can enjoy ourselves? Can we obey through disobedience? Yeshua does not belong into Christmas. It is Baal or Satan's worship. And then we have Easter. Easter comes from a form of the name Astarte, a Chaldean Babylonian goddess known as the Queen of Heaven, which is mentioned in Jeremiah 7, 18, 44, 17, and 19, 25, and 1 Kings 11, 5, 33, and 2 Kings 23, 13. Many credible sources substantiate the fact that Easter became a substitute festival for the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. There's Halloween, as with Christmas and Easter, church leaders adopted this ancient celebration to serve their own purposes. The Christian festival, the Feast of All Saints, commemorates the known and unknown saints of the Christian religion, just as Samhain had acknowledged and paid tribute to the Celtic deities. This taken from the Encyclopedia of Religion, page 177. There's Lent. There are no instructions in the Bible to observe Lent. A 40-day abstinence period was anciently observed in honor of the pagan gods Osiris, Adonis, and Tammuz. This is from John Lancier, Sabean Researchers, pages 111 and 112. Happy Valentine's Day. Centuries before Yeshua, the pagan Romans celebrated February 15 and the evening of February 14 as an idolatrous and sensuous festival in honor of Lupercus, the hunter wolves. This is from Encyclopedia Americana. Then we have Mother's Day. Historians believe that the earliest celebration of Mother's Day was the ancient springtime festival in Greece and Rome dedicated to the mother goddess Ligeria and Cybele. One of the earliest historical records of a society celebrating a mother day or mother deity can be found among the ancient Egyptians who held an annual festival to honor the goddess Isis who was commonly regarded as the mother of the pharaohs. So what happened to the creators appointed yearly festivals? Well, they got lost within his own church and were replaced with pagan holidays. The Catholic Church abolished not only the Sabbath, but all the other Jewish festivals, the annual holy days. This is in a letter from T. N. Wright, C. 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 S. S. R., Bishop of um, St. Alphonsus Church in St. Louis, Missouri, of June 1905. That was also uh, reported in Science of the Times, November 4, 1919. And there's something else recorded um, in Science of the Times, November 4, 1919, where it says, The new law has its own spirit and its own feasts, which have taken the place of those appointed in the law of Moses, the Torah. If we would know the days to be observed, we must go to the Catholic Church and not to the Mosaic law. But this apostasy is not to continue in those who will be ready to meet the heavenly king. 
We read in Prophets and Kings, page 678, because um, it says, In the time of the end, every divine institution is to be restored. Though there is more than the days of worship to be restored, if we would completely sever from modern calf worship, like Jeroboam's golden calf worship, our sins against Yahweh is twofold. As said before, not only had King Jeroboam dared to set aside Yahweh's days of worship, substituting in their place his own man-made days, he had also mixed pagan trinity worship into the service of Yahweh. The teaching of the Trinity is entirely of pagan origin. As Peter Eckler explained in the History of Christianity, he said, if paganism was conquered by Christianity, it is equally true that Christianity was corrupted by paganism. The pure deism of the first Christians, who differed from their fellow Jews only in the belief that Yahshua, Jesus, was the promised Messiah, was changed by the Church of Rome into the incomprehensible dogma of the Trinity. Many of the pagan tenets were retained as being worthy of belief. The first vital step in paganizing Christianity was the introduction into the Trinity doctrine. Thus the Catholic Church brought this non-scriptural pagan dogma into the Church, though it was founded on nothing more than man-made ideologies. Wait a minute! What about the Gospel Commission in Matthew 28.19? What does it say in Matthew 28, 19? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Well, here we have it. The Trinity are clearly mentioned by Yahshua himself, right? It's as plain as a day. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But did you know that this verse was changed in the second century? We are told in the Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 2, page 263, the baptismal formula in Matthew 28, 19 was changed from the name of Jesus Christ to the words Father, Son, and Holy Spirit by the Catholic Church in the second century. According to eyewitnesses, Eusebius, Eusebius was a church historian and bishop of Caesarea, he quoted 18 times the early book of Matthew that he had in his library in Caesarea. According to this eyewitness of an unaltered book of Matthew that could have been the original book or the first copy of the original of Matthew, Eusebius informs us of Yahshua's actual words to his disciples in the original text of Matthew 28:19. This taken from an article in Beauties of the Truth, January 1991 edition. With one word and voice, he said to his disciples, Go and make disciples of all nations, in my name, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And that name is Yeshua. So here is the original version, according to the Demonstratio Evangelica, by Eusebius, page 152. That agrees with Acts 2.38, where it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yeshua, Hamashiach, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That agrees with Acts 19.5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord, Yeshua, Jesus. Or Acts 8.12. When they believed, Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And Acts 10.48. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days.
Catholic Cardinal jo Joseph Ratzinger made this confession about the origin of the chief Trinity text of Matthew 28:19. He says, "The basic form of our profession, and talking about Matthew 28:19, of our profession of faith took shape during the course of the second and third centuries." This is in the words of Pope Benedict. It goes on. In connection with the ceremony of baptism, so far as its place of origin is concerned, the text came from the city of Rome. So what about the verses in 1 John 5, 7 to 8? For the first 1,000 years, these crossed out portions didn't appear in the Greek text. Then around 500 AD, this portion appeared in the Latin version known as the Vulgate. Historically, it is known and identified as the Johannin Kama. So we see the part which are crossed out were not in the original verses. When Erasmus published his version of the Greek New Testament, he left out the additions to John, 1 John 5-7, from his first two editions, 1516 and 1519. Arguing that he could not find those words in any Greek manuscript, <coughs> pressure by some Catholics to include this addition to the Greek text, Erasmus proposed that if they could show him a single Greek manuscript in which the addition was found, he would include it in his next edition. Now this is taken from the Seventh-day Adventist Biblical Research Institute. It says further, Surely enough, they came up with a Greek manuscript in which the addition was found. One scholar believed was dated from the 16th century AD, translated from Latin to the Greek and adapted to the Greek text. Erasmus subsequently included it in his 1522 edition of the Greek New Testament. As mentioned, this is from the SDA Biblical Research Institute. Suspicious text. Out of 113 manuscripts, the text is wanting in 112. It occurs in no manuscript before the 10th century, and the first place the text occurs in Greek is in the Greek translation of the Acts of the Council of Lateran, held in A.D. 1215. That's Bible commentary on 1 John 5. Here's what the Catholic Church states by Cardinal Hosius, or Hosius. We believe in the doctrine of the triune God because we have received it by tradition, though not mentioned at all in Scripture. The Trinity doctrine is a hub of pagan doctrine. Actually, the heart of paganism is a teaching that there is a Trinity. From this foundation center flow all other devilish doctrines. First Timothy 4 1, like spokes radiating out from a wheel hub. Today this teaching is readily accepted, believed, and practiced, and no one thinks that it could be false or being actually pagan worship. But ignorance is no excuse for error or sin when there's every opportunity to know the will of God. A man is traveling and comes to a place where there are several roads and a guide board indicating where each one leads. If he disregards the guide board, both uh, the guide board and takes whichever road seems to him be right he may be ever so sincere but will in all probability find himself on the wrong road we find that in great controversy page 597 having christianite pagan principle it isn't surprising to find that the teaching of the trinity is so pivotal to catholicism that it is the single most essential teaching of their faith. Upon it stand or fall all other doctrines, including the substitution of Sabbath for Sunday. The mystery of the Trinity is a central doctrine of the Catholic faith. Upon it are based all other teachings of the Church. And this is according to the handbook for today's Catholic page 12. 
In fact, according to Theodosius, in a Catholic edict given in 380 AD under Constantine, so Catholic has the paganized Trinity teaching become that any Christian espousing this doctrine of belief is considered by the papacy to be a Catholic Christian. Whoever believes in the Trinity doctrine is considered a Catholic Christian by the papacy. What do you think about that? Here's a quote. Let us believe the sole deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost under an equal majesty and the pious trinity. We authorize the followers of this doctrine to assume the title of Catholic Christian. And as we judge that are all others, extravagant madmen, we brand them with the infamous name of heretics. They must expect to suffer the severe penalties which our authority guided by heavenly wisdom shall think proper to inflict upon them. Today the pagan concept of the Trinity has become so popularized throughout Christendom that one cannot join the ecumenical Christian community without accepting it. This is a requirement today in order to be accepted or to be acknowledged as a Christian. But Trinitarianism wasn't part of the Reformation doctrines. In fact, it may surprise you to learn how many Protestant churches were founded by deists, believers in one God. It certainly surprised us with Seventh-day Adventist background to learn that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was founded by non-Trinitarians. In the Ministry magazine of October 1993, the following statement was found. Most of the founders of Seventh-day Adventists would not be able to join the church today if they had to subscribe to the denomination's fundamental beliefs. More specifically, most would not be able to agree with the doctrine of the Trinity. In simple words, in order to be a Seventh-day Adventist in good and regular standing, you must be a Trinitarian. To demonstrate this, consider the following statement by James White. This inexplicable Trinity that makes the Godhead three in one and one in three is bad enough, but that the ultra-Unitarianism that makes Christ inferior to the Father is worse. That's from James White, written in Review and Herald, November 29, 1877. Consider all of this clearly non-Trinitarian statement by J. H. Wagoner. The great mistake of Trinitarians in arguing this subject is this. They make no distinction between a denial of Trinity and the denial of the divinity of Christ. They see only the two extremes between which the truth lies and take every expression referring to the pre-existence of Christ as evidence of a Trinity. The scripture abundantly teach the pre-existence of Christ and his divinity, but they are entirely silent in regard to a trinity. Review and Herald, November 10, 1863. Did the Reformation go far enough? Here's a statement by James White, quoted in Weeby, E. Who is the Adventist Jesus? Published by Zulon Press in 2005 on page 89. It says, the greatest fault we can find in the Reformers is the Reformers stopped reforming. Had they gone on and onward till they had left the last vestige of the papacy behind such a sea, immortality, sprinkling, the Trinity, and Sunday keeping, the Church would now be free. Her unscriptural errors. James White quoted in that book, VBE, Who is the Adventist Jesus? Alan White, non-Trinitarian, and Jesus said he would give us a comforter. What is a comforter? It is the Holy Spirit of God. What is the Holy Spirit? It is a representative of Jesus Christ. It is our advocate that stands by our side and places our petitions before the Father, all fragrant with his means. Reflecting Christ, page 285. Now we have on uh, uh, 
a statement by Ellen White, and the question is, will Ellen White's non-Trinitarian views change? Is that possible? We have on the left the original, on the right the changed version. And we see here it says, The Lord would have every one of his children rich in faith, and in his faith is the fruit of the working of the Holy Spirit upon the mind. It dwells with each soul who will receive it. Speaking to the impenitent in words of warning and pointing them to Jesus, the Lamb of God, that was uh, in Signs of the Times, September 27, 1899. And now we go to the change version, Ye Shall Receive Power, page 59, um, published in 1995. It says, The Lord would have every one of his children rich in faith, and his faith is a fruit of the working of the Holy Spirit upon the mind. He dwells with each soul who will receive him. Him speaking to the impenitent in words of warning and pointing them to Jesus, the Lamb of God. Seventh-day Adventist original view on God. That's in the 1889 yearbook of Seventh-day Adventist. There's one God, a personal spiritual being, the creator of all things, omnipotent, omniscience, and eternal, infinite in wisdom, holiness, justice, goodness, truth, and mercy, unchangeable and everywhere present by his Holy Spirit. Now the current SDA church belief on the Godhead, there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. God is immortal, all-powerful, all-knowing, above all, ever-present. He is infinite and beyond human comprehension. Yet known through his self-revelation, he is forever worthy of worship, adoration, and service by the whole creation. That's in Fundamental Beliefs, quoted in Seventh-day Adventist Belief, a biblical Exposition of 27 Fundamental Doctrines, page 16. Adventist beliefs have changed over the years. Most startling is the teaching regarding Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The Trinitarian understanding of God, now part of our fundamental beliefs, was not generally held by the early Adventists. That was uh, published in Adventist Review, January 6, 1994, page 10. What a surprise! The question is, why did we change it? Because we want to be accepted and be part of the ecumenical movement. Now we have doctrinal changes in the hymnal. We see here the changes, for example, that were made to the song Holy, Holy, Holy from the original Seventh-day Adventist version from 1826 on the right and what it is today. In the left column. So originally we had Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God over all who rules eternity. Holy, 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 angels adore thee, casting down their bright crowns around the glassy sea. Thousand and ten thousand worship low before thee. Holy, 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 though darkness hide thee, though the eye of men thy great glory may not see, only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Now let's go to the uh, change version. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee. Casting down the golden crowns around the glassy sea, cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, who was and is and evermore shall be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful men thy glory may not see, only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. So can we see the changes? Catholic Seventh-day Adventist, question mark. In 1980, Seventh-day Adventist General Conference President Neil C. Wilson announced to the General Conference session in Dallas, Texas, that the Church had adopted the Trinity Doctrine, which was now the second of the 27 fundamental beliefs. Wilson said there is another universal and truly Catholic organization, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, published in Adventist Review, March 5, 1981. 
long ago in a nearly forgotten Bible story. The king of Israel led Yahweh's people into two grievous sins, the worship of Yahweh on man-made days. And the worship of Yahweh in pagan Trinitarianism, these were the two sins which characterized the golden calf worship of Jeroboam. Following the pattern of Aaron at Mount Sinai, and how did the Heavenly Father respond to this supposed honor of his name? Yahweh was incensed both times. Will he accept that kind of worship today? Will he let people change his instructions to their liking or opinions? Remember Malachi 3.6, For I am the Lord Yahweh, I change not. How does it stand with your soul? Are you willing to obey him? And his instructions, no matter what someone else may think of you? Are you willing to let go of the traditions of men and follow your Savior with all of your heart, mind and soul? You and I have a choice. Do your doctrines and worship of Yahweh follow scriptural instructions? Or have you inherited the lies of golden calf worship? Unknowingly mixing the worship of our sacred king with that which is pagan and profane. Have the scales of long-held pagan beliefs just fallen from your eyes, revealing that you have stood with Jeroboam? If so, take heart. It is not too late to repent and turn from all traces of golden calf worship. Check these things out for yourself, personally. Don't take anyone's word. In Rio and Herald, April 14, 1896, we find these words. The great controversy between the Prince of Light and the Prince of Darkness has not been abated one jot or tittle of its influence as time goes on. The stern conflict between light and darkness, between truth and error, is deepening in its intensity. The enemy is working continually to obliterate the truth and abolish the true pattern of goodness and righteousness. In order that the professed followers of Yahweh may swept to perdition through separation from him. Satan is trying to obliterate meaning to erase, to remove, and to destroy everything that might, in the least way, remind us of the Lord, Yahshua, and his righteous laws, the Torah, with his statutes and judgments. The latter rain is falling in the call to return to the Torah, the law of Moses, with the statutes and judgments. As we can read in Malachi 4.4, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, with the statutes and judgments. Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse 2 states, My doctrine shall fall as a rain. My speech shall distill as a dew, as a small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. The sealing is going on right now. Now is the time to prepare. Those who are uniting with the world are receiving the worldly mold and preparing for the mark of the beast. Those who are distrustful of self, who are humbling themselves before God and purifying their souls by obeying the truth. These are receiving the heavenly mold and preparing for the seal of God in their foreheads. This is taken from a book Faith to Live By, page 288. What is the seal of Yahweh? We read in Isaiah 8.16, bind up the testimony, seal the Torah among my disciples. The seal is the Torah, which includes, number one, the weekly Sabbath, according to Exodus 28-11, but not only the seventh-day Sabbath, but also the yearly Sabbath, the feast days. See Exodus 13.8-10, and thirdly, all of the other statements and judgments. See Deuteronomy 6, 1-9. And logically, what would be the mark of the beast? It would be all the doctrines, teachings, and commandments of men, which includes Sunday worship and all of the other pagan holidays, like Christmas, Easter, Halloween, St. Patrick's Day, 
Valentine, April Fool's Day, and so on. Heed the call of Yahweh, who says to you today, as recorded in 2 Corinthians 6, 17-18, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, says Yahweh Almighty. It is my prayer that we accept Yahweh's, the Lord's offer, to stay away from these abominations and do not touch the unclean things so he can accept us as his children. That was actually only a short, abbreviated study on these topics. And there's much more information which confirms beyond the shadow of a doubt that today's Christianity is no longer following in the ways of Yahweh, but following the traditions and teachings of men, meaning paganism. May the Lord help us, may he open our eyes, that we may see and understand and follow him, is my prayer. Amen. <laughs>